All right, bro. All right, just get ready. Nah, you put people asleep right now. You got to wake them up. I know. Lab. You got to go lab. Let's see. I think we're live already, but I just got to wait for the swing show. Uh, hey, well, hey, yeah, okay. We are lab. But remember, there's a 15 second delay. Lab. Sorry, guys. Initially, we're going to start at 7 p.m., but then I moved at 7.30. Now we're back to the original time that I first announced. It's now close to 8 p.m. So, But we're live. May the Father, in union with His Son, the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be glorified. May the Father bless Usama, Dok Dok, with the Spirit, to glorify Jesus Christ by exposing the filth of Islam, this filthy antichrist son of St. Muhammad who needs to be exposed. For the glory of Jesus, in Jesus' name, Father, have your way and bless your servant. So, guys, you don't need an introduction. You know who Osama Dakdok is? He was here previously. He's on again. I'm going to give him the main screen, and, the, and you're going to see his PowerPoint. And he's going to talk about women in Islam, why Muhammad is evil and his God is a false God, and why women need to be liberated from this wicked, satanic religion in Jesus' name. So, remember, Osama, there's going to be a delay, but you can keep talking. Let me put your screen up and let me remove myself. All right. Well, praise God. Thanks for the time. And all of the wonderful audience we have tonight, those who are watching the fly, and those who are watching again in the future, and as they share it with others, we need the truth to be told. Women in Islam is one of my favorite topics. As a matter of fact, this is was this was my second seminar, which I put together a good, uh, what, 19 years ago, 18, 19 years ago? I don't know, some years ago. And it is so powerful, and uh, thank God for uh, that the truth still in it can be told even years later. Uh, as you see right now, the Straightway Grace Ministry, this is the logo of our ministry here, and uh, it came out of these two verses, Quran 1.5, as Muslims pray to the Allah, the devil, asking him to guide them to the straightway. Now the answer comes from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that's where the name, the straight way of grace ministry come. Uh, we're going to move on. With our stuff. By the way, this is my beautiful wife, Vicky. And Vicky and I have been married now for 28 years. We're about to celebrate our 29th coming up. So keep us in your prayer. That'll be awesome. Now, uh, the, 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 the most important thing about revealing the truth about Islam and the topic for tonight, women in Islam, is that we have to understand that there are two groups in the West where Islam is flourishing and growing. First, black Muslim men in prison. Second, white women outside in the world. And people have always asked me the question that maybe one of the things which led me to put this presentation together. Why women in America are becoming Muslim? I mean, what is so interesting about Islam which causes the American ladies to become Muslim to the point I know personally, for some women who left their husband, the American husband, and became Muslim, and they fall in love with that Muslim man and marry them. Why? A free American woman convert to Islam and become Muslim. And I could not know the answer. I, I mean, when people used to ask me this question 25, 30 years ago, I used to scratch my head. And I said, I have no idea. You tell me. If you find a Muslim woman, American woman, who, uh, who convert to Islam, to tell us maybe we can find the answer until I went to a seminar which was given by a lady by the name Dr. Sahar. And that was in New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary just one year before September 11th. So it had to be what, 21 years ago. And in that presentation, she made women in Islam as women in heaven, not on earth, women in heaven. So I found that Islam is like heaven. As she continued to talk in this presentation for a good hour, I, I was taking some notes, but then I stopped taking notes. I mean, what notes you take after the first 15 minutes? But the question answer session came, and I raised up my hand, and it was another young lady in the front who raised also her hand. So she took the first lady's question, and the young lady stood up and she said, Dr. Sahar, how can I become a Muslim? And I could not believe my ears. I mean, for after one hour of hogwash Islam, of course that young lady and every female in America should convert to Islam. So she said to her, well, I'm glad you asked this question. And for you and all others who would love to convert to Islam after the, st the study is over, and by the way, that was in New Orleans, New Orleans University. A place you and I cannot go and speak in. Muslims speak every year days on different topics 
But anyway, so she said, what I shared today, it was the truth. And uh, I'm glad that you want to become a Muslim. All those who would like to become Muslim after the meeting is over, we'll have a special meeting where we can say the Shahada and all become Muslim together. Then I stood up and I clapped my hand. And I said, excellent speech, Dr. Sahar. But I wonder, where do you come up with this information? Is this something you... Uh, find anywhere in the Quran, anywhere in the saying of Muhammad in the Hadith. How did you learn about that subject of women Islam? Well, she said, well, it's all over the Quran. It's all over the Hadith. I said, but I never heard you sharing one verse. I never heard you sharing uh, uh, one saying of the sayings of Muhammad. She said, well, if, if I will cover all this material with verses from the Quran, it will take forever. I only have an hour and I would like to answer your questions and stuff like that. I said, good. I said, I'm not surprised that young lady in the front, she would like to convert to Islam after she heard what I heard. As a matter of fact, if I'm a woman, I myself would love to say the shahada and become a Muslim. So I said to her, would you mind if I share with you a few verses from the Quran? Because these are just the notes I took in the first 10, 15 minutes. You said, blah, blah, blah. But Allah said, blah, blah, blah. You said, blah 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 about women islam but muhammad said blah 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 the opposite and then i begged dr sahar and i said to her please please i beg you before you continue to travel all over america from one university to another from one school to another to literally deceive the american ladies into lies and deception would you please read the quran once study the saying of muhammad in the hadith once so if you find anything in the Quran or in the Hadith to support your propaganda, women in Islam subject, may Allah bless you. And may Allah make every female and every man in America a Muslim. But before you find any support to your lies, if you could not find any support of your lies from the teaching of the Quran, from the saying of Muhammad, which is the foundation of Islam, please, I beg you, stop deceiving the American people. And that point these points she was sharing in this presentation in New Orleans University. Surprise, surprise. I go online and I find them. They are given in the same order by another lady by the name Rukia Abdel Maksud. And that is my presentation, which I will be sharing with you tonight. The lies of the Muslim about women in Islam and the truth of the word of Allah in the Quran and the saying of Muhammad in the Hadith. And more important than that, the son of Muhammad, how Muhammad lived with his wives and with the slaves, with all the females which he was involved in. So women Islam is one of my favorite topics. Once again, let's move on. I uh, made a challenge last week. And in my challenge, I said, I would love to see a, a good Muslim Imam or a good Muslim man or a woman who will read to us what is written in the last of the trailer. Uh, that is concerning the penalty of uh, fornication and or sodomy on page 610 and the challenge is open all night tonight i hope brother sam can find me somebody who's willing to read what is written in that one slide if you do not have trust in me and what i'm putting on the screen here please go to the book the alliance of the traveler and the penalty of fornication and sodomy or sodomy on page 610 and you find these words exactly we actually took a picture of it and put it in the slide. So nobody tell me I changed a word. I changed the the uh, the cough, the what they call these uh, these uh, vowels in how you read this word. And my challenge for tonight, for the next hour and a half, two hour, whatever, brother Sam allows us to be with you. And uh, my challenge for next week, and my challenge for next year, and as long as I'm still alive, uh, the challenge still open for any Muslim scholar. To come and read to us what is written in that slide, which is going to be available online. I don't think Brother Sam is going to take it down. And if for somehow, if you lose it, please let me know. We'll send it to you again. If somebody can read to us that one slide and tell us what it says in English, we will all be blessed. Because that is the laws of Allah for every Muslim believer. And by the way, if we could not find any challenger, we're going to just keep it open. For the future but if somebody come will talk to us about it i got the english for that slide word for word and if we will ever get to the english part here's a warning 
warning once again warning remove your children remove your children anybody less than 18 years old from the room so if you start seeing the english for that arabic shut the computer down turn the program off do not replay while children sitting in the room all right i hope i give my warning very well and we're waiting for a muslim to call us sometime tonight now let's continue with uh some of the lies which muslims love to teach all over the west america europe australia about women islam here is the first one at the beginning, Islam was the most revolutionary liberalization of women's rights the civilized world has ever seen. How much truth do we have here? Is this true? Let's move on. We're going to move on to the next slide. Here we go. A little known fact is that Islam brought by the Prophet Muhammad is the first religion to raise women's status to be equal with men. Are you serious? Hello? My dear Muslim friends, you teach that in America. Is this really true? Women's status in Islam is equal with men? Let's move on. Next slide. Today, people think that women are liberated in the West and that the women's liberation movement began in the 20th century. Actually, the women's liberation movement was not begun by women, but was revealed by God to a man in the 7th century by the name of Muhammad who is known as the last prophet of Islam. The Quran and the traditions of the prophet are the sources from which every Muslim woman derives her rights and duties. You kidding me or you serious? Women has been liberated by Muhammad in the seventh century. And how we learn about that, we learn about that from the Quran and from the Sunnah. Well, I cannot wait to open the Quran. I cannot wait to investigate the Hadith the saying of Muhammad and the son of Muhammad to see if any of these claims is truthful. Let's move on. Next one. God knows best that which he created. He created human beings. He is a God of wisdom and a God of all knowledge. And so therefore he knows what is best. And he decrees that which is best for humanity, his creatures. Therefore, Muslims try to live by a code of law, which is an expression of that belief. Now, I don't want to discuss the various details of the code of law because that I feel would not really benefit us in this lecture. <laughs> Wait a minute, a minute. You're telling me that Allah is the all-knowing, the smart, the wise, uh, the one who created us. He knows how human live, how men live, how women live. He, he, he gave us the best code of law. Hey, here we go. The code of law, the Sharia, the reliance of the traveler, Ahmed and Sally. Allah, the one who gave us that code of law, knows the best way for men and women to live. And he put this code of law that will live happy forever after. And you, the Muslim believers, will not talk about that code of law, the Sharia, because it will not benefit you in the lecture about women in Islam. Are you lying to me or are you telling me the truth? If Sharia is the best law Allah made for mankind and for women, why can't you open and share with me? That's why we got you one slide out of that book which we're going to play it again and again and again for the hope that some muslim imam some muslim scholar will have the guts and have the boldness and be proud and bragging about the code of law the islamic system which allah almighty gave to you muslim people to live by to read to us that one law i'm not going to quote the whole book i'm not going to go to the, my expertise on that topic because believe it or not in college in egypt as a, show, as a social worker, I studied two years Sharia in the topic of marriage and divorce. Can you imagine that with me? So if before I, I was just what, 19 and 20 years old. The first two years in college, maybe I was 21. And I learned about Sharia. If I will share with you tonight concerning women in Islam, you will cry blood, not water. Literally blood for every Muslim female. And the abuse which Allah in that book, the book of Sharia, is given to every Muslim woman to live by. If there is any abuse, it's in that book for every female in the Islamic savage cult. But 
our uh, wonderful uh, scholars here will not <laughs> will not tell us anything because it will not benefit them it will actually destroy their propaganda and their lies about women in islam i want you to hear that story because guess what that is the story of thousands and thousands of american female who were deceived by these lies we just heard about women in islam so please listen carefully I loved Asham. We met at college and dated steadily through my junior and senior years. With Asham, I felt like a princess. He showered me with gifts and treated me with a gracious chivalry that I hadn't known in any American man. He was thoughtful, considerate, ruggedly handsome, intelligent, and oddly spiritual. I did not give much thought to his devout Muslim faith. As a casual Baptist, I assumed that everyone who attended church, a synagogue, or a mosque was basically on the same track. His morality certainly seemed higher than that of the other white boys I had dated. We married in the summer and vacationed in his home country in a beautiful, majestic place with tall spires and rolling hills. At the mosque, I was bemused by the practices. Back in the United States, we settled into a routine of work play, and eventually children. The changes in Asham appeared slowly. Occasionally, he became abrupt with me and our five-year-old son. He constantly sent money overseas, supposedly to his family, and was secretive, especially when his friends came around. Every Friday, Asham took our son to the mosque, although I no longer went with them. Then one Friday, I discovered that Asham had left the country with our son. In the subsequent weeks, I discovered to my horror that myself and my child were considered Muslims, converted at least on paper. Thus, my son had to be raised in Islam. Because my rights to my child were minimal in his country, my child was gone and my life was forever marred. I did not know that I had joined a growing culture, a culture of white American women who marry foreign Muslim men. This is the sad story. This is the end of the series of lies which Muslim given to our females in the West. And by the way, I, I never heard these teachings anywhere in Egypt. I mean, I grew up in Egypt in this beautiful Muslim country with uh, 80 some million Muslim men and women. Never heard of that before. Why only in the West they have this message? Why we never hear about that in the Muslim world? Because they cannot lie against what is happening. Do you know that if these women and these men teach these lies in the Middle East, they will be killed by the Muslim believers? Because they will be destroying Islam. That's exactly the truth. This is the sad story which we see in America, sadly, and all over the West. Now, someone is lying. Someone is not telling the truth. The Muslims are making women in Islam, as I said, women in heaven. But the testimony we hear from thousands of Muslim, of American women who became Muslim, who left Islam, is the opposite story. Who is telling the truth? Once again, Islam is not what I or that lady shared with you, but Islam is the word of Allah in the Quran. Islam is the saying and the sunnah of Muhammad as we read it throughout the hadith. Do we find any of this hogwash, propaganda Islam, anywhere in Allah's words or in the saying of Muhammad? Or did Muhammad ever do practice any of these things which Muslims teach in the West? The opposite is true. That's why we must follow the rest of this study together carefully. First, by listening to what Joseph Goblus said about lying. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, People will eventually come to believe it. The truth is the mortal enemy of the lie. How you kill a rat? Give him a bag of poison. No, 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 no. Rats will not eat poison. Gives him cheese. Good corn. Good wheat. 99.4 good food. And less than 1%, 0 0.6, 0 0.5 poison. And the rat will eat it. And the rat will die. So what do I'm trying to say here? If you want to tell a lie, you have to be smart. Tell a lie big enough. And the catch is that you repeat it often. A 
American people, and sadly, women in America will believe these lies. This is the point of this seminar. This is the point of our study tonight. Here is the lies, and here is the truth. And you can judge for yourself. Here, I would like to introduce you to Sister Rukia Abdul Maksud. Listen carefully. English convert to Islam, Rakia Waris Maksud, is the author of over 30 books on Islam and other subjects. A former head of religious studies at various UK inner city secondary schools, she is probably Britain's leading authority on GCSC Islamic studies. Wow. I did not write 30 books. So far, I wrote four and small two booklets. I don't think I'm going to write 30 books when I hit my 80s. I mean, if I live to be 80, I don't think I'll have the, the strength or the power or the time to write to write 30 books. She wrote 30. Rukia Maksud is a British woman who converted to Islam, married to a Muslim Pakistani man who she fell in love with. Sadly, he left her later to marry his own cousin, uh, half of her age. She was used by the Muslims, and until now, she is used by Islam. Let's learn more about Rakia Abdul Maksud. Sister Rakia identifies with the battle to preserve Islam as the one true faith, tolerant, noble, and compassionate, in face of the growth of the other Islam, which is extremist and intolerant, and which she regards as both false and dangerous. She's doing what? She's preserving Islam. I'm sorry. She is creating a brand new Islam, not preserved. You preserve something if it is there. If you are making something out of air and you say that's what it is, you are not preserving. She's talking about two Islam. There is a good Islam. She's working hard to, to, to literally preserve it, to uh, protect it from any evil. And the bad one, the false Islam. Do you know what she's doing? She is rejecting in the entire teaching of her broad, 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 uh, program here. She is rejecting everything Allah said in the Quran. She is rejecting everything Muhammad said in the Hadith. And she's making brand new Islam for the West, for the British. And I'm not surprised that that one Muslim lady, British who became Muslim, led thousands of young girls and young men all over England to Islam. I'm not surprised. After all, 30 books, that's not uh, a small amount of materials. And she's teaching Islam all over the education in England. Surprise, surprise, just last week, I got a letter, a nice paper, and they said, now the school board vote for teaching the Quran in our school system here in Missouri, in St. Louis, Missouri. Wow. They're going to teach the Quran? Or they're going to teach propaganda about the Quran? And you see, I have no problem for the whole world to study the Quran. That's why we worked hard in our ministry to translate it accurately. And I wish for every home in America to read the Quran. And I wish for every person in the world to read the Quran because trust me, that is reason number one why Muslims leave Islam is because yes, read the Quran. Reason number two, because they know about Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. So if we can really teach the Quran in our school system in America, I guarantee you that will end the growth uh, and the spread of Islam in America. That will be the end of Islam, not just in America, but maybe this will stop Islam all over the world too. But the problem is they're not teaching Islam. They're not teaching the Quran. They're teaching propaganda about the Quran, propaganda about Islam, as we just heard today in the beginning of our study. So let's move on to the next slide. Her own word, Dr. Rukia Abdul Maksud is telling us the following. How can anyone justify Islam's treatment of women when it imprisons the Afghans under blue shuttlecock burqas and makes Pakistani girls marry strangers against their will? Excuse me, what? You mean the hijab have nothing to do with Islam? You mean for a young uh, Muslim lady, young Muslim girl to marry to a stranger against her will, that's not Islam? Let's continue. But before we actually continue, this as a question. Did Muhammad marry girls against their will? Did Muhammad marry little girls? Because don't believe me, as I'm going to share with you, believe what is written in the Muslim sources, the Quran and the Hadith, Allah and Muhammad. For we know for sure Muhammad did these two things, as we're going to share with you in a little bit. Let's continue. Indeed, there was in the Apostle of Allah a noble example for you. For him who was hoping in Allah and in the last day and remember Allah much. Hmm. Now we know from Quran chapter 33 verse 21 that Muhammad is the perfect example. 
Muhammad is a noble example. Every Muslim must imitate Muhammad because that's what Allah's will is. And if Muhammad had married li little girls and women against their will, every Muslim believer has a right to do so. Let's continue. Muhammad had 13 wives. Oh, brother, you some. How did you know that? I just read some books. Uh, like uh, the book of uh, like the book uh, the woman of the prophet like the war the book of uh, Sahih al-Bukhari like the life of Muhammad the life of Prophet Muhammad by Ibn Hisham and and, and and plenty of other books and as we read this book surprise surprise we learn about Muhammad wives 13 concubines 30 plus and by the way Muslim scholar will give you different numbers some will tell you he was married to 20, he's married to 30. I picked up 13 because that's the smallest number, okay? I don't want some Muslim to call the show tonight and say, hey, you're wrong. They were not 30, they were not 40. They were only 22. No, 13. We'll go to the bottom line. One of the wives of Muhammad, whom he married before he even claimed to be a prophet for years, by the name Khadija, she was uh, 20 years older than him. She actually used to be his boss. He used to work for her. You see, before Muhammad claimed to be a prophet, women were in a very high position in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca, that women used to own businesses and men work for them. But after Islam came, women stayed at their homes, Quran 33, 33. And women cannot be in public. And women this and women that. Literally, all of what women enjoyed before Islam in life was canceled by Muhammad becoming a prophet. Now, Muhammad, when he was married to her, he never had a thought to have another wife. So he was married to one wife. She was the boss and he was the worker for the boss. Until Khadija died, Muhammad never thought to marry another wife. But when Khadija died, Muhammad married Aisha. And who's Aisha? Uh, she was uh, the daughter of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Uh, she was... Uh, six years old when Muhammad married her, he was 51, and he was involved with her sexually at the age of nine, as we're going to show you as we continue our study. He was 60, he was 54, and she was nine. But we have a problem. Why? Muhammad is a, a, a busy man, he's a prophet, and he cannot have six years old child, you know, hang around his neck. That's why he married another wife by the name Sauda bint Zima. Sauda bint Zima, she was not an attractive woman, she was not beautiful, she was not you know, sexy woman. So he married her for one reason, and one reason which is he she would be the babysit for his beautiful wife Aisha. Now, when Aisha grew up and became nine years old, Muhammad now can enjoy her fully sexually, and he no longer need uh, Sauda bin Tizima as this ugly and unattractive woman. So he decided to divorce her. So she begged him, Oh, Apostle of Allah, I beg you. I beg you, Abbas Mala, don't divorce me. I want to be one of your wives in the day of the resurrection. Please keep me as one of your wives. And I made you a deal. You see, I know how much you love your wife, Aisha. I will give my night to you, the night where you're supposed to sleep with me. I don't have any desire sexually. I don't want to be involved. I know you're not interested in me. I will give my night to your beautiful wife, Aisha. But please don't divorce me. And Muhammad did not divorce Sauda bint Zima. And he kept her as a wife, only on paper, only on the side. And he enjoyed Aisha twice as more than any of the rest of his 13 wives. Uh, another uh, wife of Muhammad is called Zainab bint Jahsh. Who is Zainab bint Jahsh? Uh, we learn about it from the Quran. Quran chapter 33, beginning from verse 37, and every Muslim knows the story. She was actually the wife of his adopted son, Zayd. Uh, Zayd. And uh, Muhammad went one time to check on his son, Zayd, and on his wife. And uh, behold, it was a, a windy night, and Zainab bin Tijah, she was actually dressed in soft clothes, and the wind... <clears throat> lift up her clothes so we do not know exactly what muhammad saw but he saw something uh, draw his lust after her uh, you can use your imagination so he said the statement subhanallah how great allah is who changed my heart towards you <laughs> i no longer love you as a daughter of law but i love you as a man love a woman so she said that statement to her husband zaid when he came late at night 
the apostle of here the apostle was here and he saw whatever he saw out of me and he said the statement well Zaid is so smart he knows Muhammad will marry his wife as a divorced woman or as a widow which means Muhammad will send somebody to take care of Zaid and now Zainab is free she's no longer married to his son in adoption by adoption and then he will marry so he actually went to Muhammad and said I want to divorce my wife Oh, keep your wife. Allah in the Quran said, Why do you lie, Muhammad? Why you hide in your heart what I'm about to reveal the whole world? You like her, you love her, you lust with her. So what Muhammad did? First he said, Keep your wife, and then he said, Well, okay, divorce her. And when he divorced her, Muhammad was able to enjoy his daughter-in-law. Shame on every Muslim who believe in the words of Allah in the Quran. That there is no shame on Muhammad to be involved sexually to his with his daughter-in-law. Maybe you think I'm making this up. No, my friend, I'm not making this up. Here's the word of Allah in the Quran. So listen carefully what Allah said in Quran chapter 33, beginning from verse 37. And when you said to whom Allah had graced on, and you graced on, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah. And you did hide in yourself what Allah would reveal, and you feared the people. And Allah is more worthy to be feared. Why Muhammad fears the people? Because it's a shameful thing, even in the wilderness of the Saudi Arabia, in the desert there, in the hot deserts, in the sand, where camel and people live together. It is shameful for a man to be married to his daughter-in-law. And Muhammad knew it. So he was hiding his heart, his lust after Zainab bin Tijash, and he will uh, tell his, uh, his son, oh, keep your wife, man. Don't divorce her. Oh, come on. She's beautiful. She's nice. Keep your wife. No, he wanted him to divorce her so he can enjoy her sexually. Let's continue with the verse. So when Zaid had satisfied his desire from her, we married her to you so that it would not be a shame on the believers to marry the wives of their sons. <laughs> Don't you love how Allah make it easy for Muslim men to be married to the wives of their adopted sons? And by the way, we can talk about that some other time. Muhammad ended the adoption. One of the noble things, one of the great things which Arab practiced for years before Muhammad, which is adoption. I understand that very well as a father who adopted a son myself as a believer in Christ who adopted through the blood of Jesus to the kingdom of God I understand what it is to be adopted as a father or as a person myself and that honorable thing which Arab enjoyed Muhammad canceled in the Quran because of his lust because of his sin with Zainab bin Tijash, the wife of his adopted son can talk about that later some other time but in simple word shame on every muslim who call himself a believer who will be married to his daughter-in-law to adopt a son or not because it doesn't make any difference if we go to the book of deuteronomy if we go to the laws of moses as Muslims say, we believe in Moses, we believe in the Torah. Do you know not Moses nor the Torah? God said in the Bible, you should never do that. That's a sin. Punishing, it is punished by stoning to death. As many sins, Muhammad made it lawful for Muslims to practice in Islam. Here, uh, verse 38, Allah said, There was no shame on the Prophet where Allah had ordained for him. The custom of Allah with those who have gone before and the command of Allah was a predetermined decree. Really? Where in the Bible we see that God said, because that's what Muhammad said, this is what the custom of the past. Where in the Bible we see it's okay for a prophet to marry his daughter-in-law? Once again, shame on Allah and shame on Muhammad. Let's go back to Dr. Rakia Abdul Maksud to, listen, to learn a little bit more about the lies they teach in the West about women in Islam. How can you respect a religion that forces women into polygamous marriages, mutilates their genitals, forbids them to drive cars, and subjects them to humiliation of instant divorce? A woman forbidden from driving a car in Riyadh will cheerfully take the wheel when abroad. Confident that her country's bizarre law has nothing to do with Islam. In fact, 
None of these practices are Islamic at all. <laughs> don't you love to hear this from Dr. Rakia Abdul Maksud? I don't know who gave her a doctorate degree. Doctorate degree of what? She is rejecting Sharia. She is rejecting the word of Allah in the Quran. Dr. Rukiya does not know what Allah said here in that book concerning marriage and divorce. Polygamy is not rejecting Islam. Mutilate the female genitalia uh, in Islam. It is Quran. It's here in that book. And even in that book, they translate it inaccurately. They lie when they move it from Arabic to English. And we can expose this to you if we have time in the future. Because what the Sharia said in Arabic, one thing, and what they wrote here is a little bit. And let me give it to you quickly here. In that book, they said that when they circumcise the female, they don't cut it all the way. They cut, you know, half of it, uh, 40%. That was a lie in that book. Because the Arabic said to be cut completely off. So a female in Islam would be simply a sexual toy for men to enjoy. No more, no less. They have zero pleasure. And uh, in Islam, they will tell you what is better. For a woman to be uh, fully, uh, 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 you know, enjoy her sexual activity and commit adultery or commit fornication and to be stoned to death, or we cut it off and she have no pleasure, so so she will never be tempted and she will never commit adultery, so she will live, she will live happy. She just have lots of babies, lots of babies, lots of boys, and the husband will be happy and she'll have a happy, joyful life. That's how sick the Muslims are. Uh, <laughs> instant divorce. You mean in the Quran there is no instant divorce? Really? Uh, women cannot drive a car. You mean the Quran does not say for women to stay at their homes? Oh, Riyadh. See, in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia, these bizarre laws, it's not Islam. Islam teach freedom. Islam teach liberty. Islam teach women and men are equal. And in Islam, a woman can drive a car. Are you out of your mind? Maybe you are, if you believe these lies. But thank God we got the Quran and we got the Hadith and we got the Sharia. We can open and see how much of these lies are truthful. Here we go. Let's get to the next slide here, according to Dr. Rukiya Abdul Maksud, who said Afghan women educated before the Taliban rule know that banning girls from school is forbidden in Islam which encourages all Muslims to seek knowledge from cradle to grave from every source possible. I love it how Muslim like Dr. Rukiya just make up stuff about Islam. And if you hear him and if you see them, they're very sincere. You can you couldn't even have a second thought or any doubt that what you're telling you what they're telling you is truth. Taliban, what is Taliban? These are the bad radical Muslims. They're bad Muslims, excuse me. There are the true Muslim believers who practice Islam. Do we see anywhere in the Quran Allah said for all Muslims to seek knowledge? All, all Muslims? Men, women? Did Muhammad say, teach your women and teach your men the same? As, as a matter of fact, there is no seeking knowledge anywhere in the Quran. If Muhammad would have the, 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 the opportunity to write a couple more sentences in the Quran, as we know today how many errors all over the Quran, he would put a verse there, do not teach your men or your women anything about knowledge. Because if they figure out the earth is not flat, I'm out. If they figure out the earth does, the, the earth is moving around once every day and once every year around the sun. If they figure this out, I'm out because my false teaching is all over the Quran. So Muhammad will have advised the Muslim if he knows what's happening today, not to teach his children anything. When well, Muhammad taught them to teach their children, to teach their children to do what? To teach the children to ride horses, to swim, to use the spears, and to use the swords, and to use uh, all these old weaponry, which is known in his days, because he wants to invade the world with his men. Not girls now, men. But Muhammad never said, there's no one place in the Quran not one place in the hadith where Muhammad teach, uh, oh, all Muslims should seek knowledge from cradle to grave. Where? So, my dear Muslim, before you make up a lie, find a source to support your lies. Because it's easy for me to destroy all your lies. Because I know there's nothing about what you said is true. Let's see what Muhammad said in Kunuz al-Ilum. You know what Kunuz al-Ilum is? 
the um, the juries of knowledge. That's the word canoes. Kins, it is like juries, uh, some uh, 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 diamonds and gold and, and, and precious stone. Canoes. العلوم. What is علوم? Science. The juries of science. Let's see what did Muhammad said in that book. Okay, here we go. Listen. Listen. Do not let women into all of the rooms and do not teach them how to write. Teach them to spin and recite Surah Al Nur. Don't teach your women how to write. I saw Dr. Rukia said, teach all Muslims. When all means what? Men, women, boys, and girls, old and young. No, 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 no. First of all, women cannot be moved from all over the rooms. That's why Allah said in Quran chapter 33 and verse 33 to stay in their houses. They don't go outside unless they're going to go potty. And then Allah said what? Teach them to spin, <laughs> make clothes, and to recite, to memorize Surah Al-Nur. What is Surah Al-Nur? That's Quran chapter 24. And we're going to be sharing with you a couple of verses from that chapter tonight. So you know why Muhammad really want Muslim ladies to memorize that chapter. All right, let's move on uh, to Dr. Rukayya, who stated, The Quran is addressed to all Muslims, and for the most part, it does not differentiate between male and female. Man and woman, it says, were created of a single soul and are moral equals in the sight of God. Women have the right to divorce, to inherit property, to conduct business, and to have access to knowledge. What is your source, Dr. Rukia? Can you help us and tell us where you come up with this great knowledge? First of all, the Quran is addressed to men, not to all Muslims, no, to men. Men and women were created from one soul. I'm going to quote you the verse, which is theological error in the Quran. Every human have his own soul. I have my own soul. My wife have her, have her own soul. Adam have his own soul. Eve have her own soul. Man and woman are not created from one soul. They're two separate souls. And then she said, God. <laughs> Men and women are equal, are moral equals in the sight of God. How about in the word of God? First of all, capital G-O-D is not Allah. That is a lie. That is the biggest lie from the bottom of hell. When Muslims talk about God with a capital G, that is not true. They're talking about Allah. Small G-O-D, yes, no problem. But capital G-O-D, mm -mm, that's a lie. So in the sight of Allah, they're equal. But in the word of Allah, they're not equal. Wonderful. How did Dr. Rukai know that? Did she go inside God's head and see through his eye that men and women are equal? If men and women are mortally equal in the sight of Allah, they should be also equal in the word of Allah. But they're not. Now, she said women have the right to, listen, to divorce. That's a lie. Inherit property. That's not accurate. Yes, inherit, but not like men. To uh, conduct business before Islam, yes, when Muhammad was married to Khadija before he claimed to be a prophet, not after Muhammad became a prophet, and to have access to knowledge. How many wrong? How many mistakes we have so far? The five points she shared, they're all wrong. She's lying, and we're gonna prove it by the book, not from my head, but from the book. What book? Their books, the Quran and the Hadith. First of all, here's the verse she quoted from Quran chapter 4, verse 1, which is theologically error. It's not right. Oh, you people, fear your Lord who created you from a single soul and created a wife from it. And from them he spread many men and women. And fear Allah, of whom you ask of him and the wombs. Surely Allah was watching over you. First of all, men and women were not created from one soul. Adam's soul have nothing to do with Eve's soul. And here, Zaw Joha, Zaw Jiha. Zawjiha, no. The word wife here is wrong. Zawjato, feminine, no Zawjiha. Zawjiha is a, her husband. He did not create from Adam's soul his husband. Zawjato, the feminine from Zawjiha. That's one of the errors as we shared with you in our uh, previous study. Now, let's move on to Quran 2, 178. She said women and men are equal. 
in, in on Allah's sight, you know, but not in his words. Let me prove to you that they're not equal in his words. Quran chapter 2 and verse 178. Allah said, O you who have believed, retaliation is decreed on you for the murdered, the free man for the free, and the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. If in Allah's sight, men and women are equal, the punishment for committing murder should be the same. If a man kill a woman, he will be killed. If a woman kill a man, she will be killed. But that's not how it works in Islam. Retaliation is a big deal in Egypt. Where I come from, from upper Egypt. I mean, we have tar. Tar means retaliation almost every week. People kill each other. What you see in Chicago uh, or you see in, uh, in, uh, in New York, they're shooting and killing. That is the normal life I grew up in. You hear a bullet, pop, pop, pop. Somebody shot somebody. And then a little bit later, pop, pop, pop. The other person retaliates for the killing of the first one. That exists in the mosque in Egypt. A Sunni man go inside the Shia mosque and blow himself apart using, you know, a vest of bomb and he kill 50 people. Then the people of that mosque who are Shiite will find somebody who's willing to die for Allah, put a vest around his chest and go to the Sunni mosque to retaliate. So Muslims always retaliate from one another and kill one another. Why? Because of that one verse, Quran chapter 2 and verse 178. But listen carefully now, listen carefully to what, what Allah said in that verse. Retaliation is ordained to you or decreed to you, okay, for the murder. The free man for the free. So if I'm a free man and I kill the free man, the family of the free man has the right to kill me. Now, if I'm a free man and I kill the slave, the owner of the slave have no right to kill me because a slave for a slave, which means the owner of the slave whom I killed will find a slave in my possession and he will kill him. And a, a female for a female. So if I killed somebody's wife, that somebody has a right to retaliate, not by killing me. I'm a free man. He will kill my wife. And that is the most savage law is given for Muslims to live by and to practice retaliation. That's not a biblical teaching. The man who commit murder in the Bible, Old Testament, must be killed by another person's hand. Or the woman who commit murder. It doesn't matter who you're killing. If you kill a slave or you kill a, or you kill a, a free man or a free woman. No such a thing as you kill an innocent person for the lost to retaliate for the loss, for your own loss. That does not make any sense at all. But from that verse, Dr. Raki Abdul Maksud, we know for sure that men and women and slaves in Islam are not equal. Or why Allah said that you retaliate by killing equal to that which you lost, not by killing the person who commit the murder. Let's continue with Sahih al-Bukhari, and that is Hadith uh, Rakam, uh, number 826 in volume 3. Muhammad said the following. Muhammad asked some women, isn't the witness of a woman equal to half that of a man? The women said, yes. He said, this is because of the deficiency of the woman's mind. I saw it. The testimony of women equal to the testimony of men. That's what I call it that. But we get you another verse in the Quran a little bit later to cover the same point. But here we learn from Prophet Muhammad. May Allah's prayer and Allah's peace be upon him. He's telling us that women are stupid. And Allah in the Quran said, two women equal to one man as a witness. Uh, so obviously, these are not equal. Let's move on to another hadith by Muhammad, who Muhammad said, Muhammad said, if there is a bad omen in anything, it is in the house and the woman and the horse. <laughs> Women are bad luck. And I have no idea where Muhammad come up with this uh, to make women equal to horse or whatever. Anyway, let's uh, move on to um, this very important verse. What about if a man and a woman commit the same sin, the sin of uh, uh, the, uh, 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 homosexuality, two guys or two girls? Let's see what is the punishment, uh, the punishment for two guys. And for those who commit indecency among your women, so call four witnesses from among you against them. So if they testify, so detain them within their houses until death takes them or Allah makes another way for them. Well, I'm sorry, I said to men, it's for two women. I got to have the uh, sound in the right order here. Two women commit uh, 
adultery, uh, lesbian lifestyle. You bring four witness and they go in prison in their homes until they die. Or maybe Muhammad left. Oh, Allah come up with another answer later. For now, for now, Allah said, because Allah does not know what's going to happen tomorrow or next month or next year. Uh, for now, if two women live the lifestyle of lesbianism, uh, they be in prison in their homes. Now, what happened if two men did the same thing? What happened if two men did the same thing? Live as homosexual. And if two among you commit it, then punish them both. So if they repent and reform, then leave them alone. Surely Allah was relenting, merciful. Why Allah did not say to put these men in prison in their homes for the rest of their life? Why just do a little bit punishment and let them go? And by the way, Allah changed his mind later, and he actually uh, ordered Muhammad to throw them from the top of the high mountain and kill them, because that is a punishment for homosexuality in Islam. Let's move on to the next statement here about uh, what can a wife do without the permission of their husbands? A wife is forbidden to perform extra prayers or observe fasting without the permission of her husband. Can you imagine that? So you want to fast? <laughs> no, no. Your husband have to tell you first, you, honey, it's okay. You can fast tomorrow. Otherwise, you're not fasting. Well, I, I want to perform extra prayer. No, 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 no. You cannot pray uh, unless your husband give you permission first. Really? Are you serious? Yes, indeed. That is what Muslims believe because that is what Muhammad taught them. What about the Bible? Do you think the Bible has the same thing or something close to it? Let's read what the Bible said in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Did you hear what the scripture said? Did you hear what the Bible teaches as Christians? There's no difference. If you're a man or a woman. If you are free or slave, if you are a Hebrew or a Greek, Gentile. Okay, she said men and women are equal, but Allah did not say that. In Quran chapter 4, verse 34, we read, Men are in charge of women because Allah preferred some of them above the others and because of what they spend out of their money. So good women are obedient. Guarding in secret that which Allah has guarded. And the rest of this verse will come a little bit later to learn how beautiful is the treatment of men to their wives in Islam. But for now, men are in charge of women. The, the Quran did not say there's no difference between men and women. No, he said men are in charge of women. Why? Because Allah made it that way. Allah prefer men over women. End of story. After all, men working hard and provide for the family. You know that women can work harder and make twice or three or four times more than men? If that's the only reason, men and women should be uh, in a changeable position. In one other verse, women are in charge of men because they provide four times more than men can provide. No, Allah preferred men over women. Allah said men are in charge of women. End of story. Don't argue with Allah. You can argue with the uh, propagandists who are teaching hogwash Islam in the West concerning women is not any other topic but don't argue with the word of Allah first uh, Peter 3 7 we got a beautiful verse and so Ephesians husbands dwell with them according to knowledge giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered not only the Bible said that men and women are equal but man cannot pray his prayer will not go anywhere if he is not treating his wife right Yes, man is stronger. Yes, man is provider. Yes, man is all that. But we treat our wives with honor. We treat them with respect. We treat them with love. Otherwise, our prayer will hit the ceiling, come back in our head. as like we're not praying. Our prayer will be hindered. We cannot say we're a Christian believers if we do not respect and treat our wives with honor. Not in, like in Islam. The opposite story there. How about Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Do you understand what the scripture is teaching here? I must love my wife as Christ loves the church. So what did Christ did to the church? Give her a box of chocolate to make her fat? Give her flour to make her to make it uh, to make it a romantic relationship? No. 
God loves the church by sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for the church. I must love my wife as Christ loves the church. I must be willing to die for my wife. Show me something like that or near that or even anywhere close to that in the teaching of the Quran or the saying of Muhammad. No, men are in charge of women. And you women, you better be obedient because what else is coming a little bit to see the rest of that verse in our study. Well, let's move on to Dr. Rakia Maksud to learn a little bit more about her lies. Here she said. Some of the commands are alien to Western tradition. Requirements of ritual purity may seem to restrict a woman's access to religious life, but are viewed as confessions. During ministration or postpartum bleeding, she may not pray the ritual salah or touch the Quran, and she does not have to fast, nor does she need to fast while pregnant or nursing. Wow, don't you love that? It's just culture. It just things out of her hand. Uh, you know, things, uh, you know, just put this, ignore it. Do you know why women will not make it to paradise in Islam, as Muhammad said? Because they don't pray enough. Because they don't read the Quran. Because they don't fast enough. And Muhammad asked him to do more charities so that they can cover for their sins. The things which Allah puts them through cause them to go to hell. Allah is sending women to hell in Islam. We don't have that in Christianity. Praise God. Women are clean all year long. Men and women are clean all their life by accepting the sacrificial, the, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ on our behalf. We're free from any, any, any uncleanness, any wickedness, any sin in our life. That's not in Islam. In Islam, women are like that. Uh, let's look at Quran 4, 43 to see uh, about men and women and prayer. Men and women and prayers. Listen carefully, please. O oh, you who have believed, do not come near the prayer while you are drunk until you know what you are saying, nor after sexual orgasm, except that you are merely passing by until you wash. And if you were sick or traveling or one of you has relieved himself or you have touched the women, so you did not find water, then rub your face and your hands with good dirt. Surely Allah was pardoning, forgiving. Muslim men, Allah speaks to them, you don't come to prayer if you are drunk, if you are unclean, you have to wash, you have to do all this good uh, wudu. But if you touch a woman, <laughs> now you need to go back and wash. What if there's no water? No big deal. Some good dirt. Tayammum. What is good dirt? Uh, it is loose dirt. No camel pee pee or camel poopy in it. If it's loose dirt, it's good dirt. By the way, my mama told me no such a thing as good dirt. Every dirt is dirty. So you get your some soft loose dirt and you rub your face and you rub your hand and now you're ready to go to pray. After what? After touching a woman. Man, how dirty are they? Well, uh, they're dirty. <laughs> in conclusion, the Quran teaches that women are dirtier than dirt. As a matter of fact, dirt is like shampoo. Dirt like a good soap. Imagine with me now with the coronavirus all over the world. Uh, Muslim men, don't touch the women. They're dirty, they're clean. And just keep some good dirt with you. Whenever you shake somebody's hand, you may be may afraid that he have corona or somebody else have corona. Just rub your hand with good dirt. Let's, let's bring good dirt to our hospitals and our clinics so we can uh, keep ourselves clean from coronavirus. Makes sense. Allah is all-knowing. Women are dirtier than dirt in Islam. What about what the Bible teach about women position? Women position in the Bible. In the Quran, we found it. The dirtier than dirt. How about in the Bible? Listen carefully. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 13, a similar passage. In Luke chapter 7, verse 36, there are two different women, by the way. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall be also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. What did this woman do? She touched Jesus. What did this woman do? She actually cried and washed his feet with her tears and dries them with her hair. 
that it's in in Luke seven thirty six, I believe uh, that Simon the first said, "If this is uh, a prophet from God, he should know what kind of woman touched him." And Jesus read his mind. Re Jesus read his thought, and he told them, "I know what kind of woman is this, Simon. I come to your house. You did not wash my feet. She washed them with her tears." You did not clean my, dry my hand. She dried with her hair. You don't kiss my head or kiss my cheek as we do in our culture in the Middle East. She did not stop kissing my feet. And Jesus did not say, hey, somebody get me some good dirt, please. Can we have some good dirt so I can wash and get clean after touch and this woman touched me? No. We're celebrating that woman. Even today, 2020, all over our churches, as long as we read these passages in the Bible, we never say these two women touch Jesus and Jesus become unclean. No, they touch Jesus and they become pure. For the Holy One sets them free from their sins. Oh, let's move on to Luke 8, 1 to 3. Listen carefully to the word of God. And it came to pass that afterward he went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women which had been revealed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Shusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance." Why Dr. Luke bothered to put all these women names in the in, in his passage here in chapter 8? Maybe he would like to add a couple verses to the book. No! He still has a position which the Holy Spirit gave to these women in the ministry of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Where can we find similar passages like that in the Quran that some women were involved in Muhammad's ministry? No. We can only find women with a high position to be holy, to be pure, to be equal to men, to be ministers, to serve the Lord, to serve the, to serve the disciples, and to serve in the early church, and they still serve today in the church. It is in the Christian faith, not in the savage cult, the cult of Islam. Let's go to Sahih Muslim, uh, volume, uh, book number four, hadith number 1032. Uh, Bukhari, hadith number 514, and many other locations. These hadiths are repeated all over, all over uh, the Muslim uh, books about Muhammad. Listen to what Muhammad said. Abdallah ibn al-Samit said, Abu Dar said, the messenger of Allah said, when one of you stands in prayer, what definitely constitutes a barrier for him is an object placed in front of him of the same height as the back of a camel saddle. If it is not in front of him, and of the same height as the back of a camel saddle, then some stray donkey or some woman passing or some black dog will cut off his prayer. I said, O oh, Abu Dar, what is it that makes a black dog different from a red or yellow dog? He replied, O oh, dear cousin, I asked the messenger of Allah that exact same question. He said that the black dog is a devil. How do you like that, ladies? In Christianity, man and woman can hold hand and pray together. In Islam, if you touch a woman, you're unclean. You get get some good dirt, rub your hand, and your face to become no. In Christianity, women is respected. In Islam, is like that. You stand up to pray. Make sure there is something high, as high maybe a good what five five feet or so, five and a half feet. So if women go by, or a donkey, or a black dog went by, it will cause a prayer. See, the angels will not be in the room if a woman go by. Or a black dog. Why black dog? Demon possessed dog. Or a donkey. These are the three which caught the Muslim men prayer. A woman, a dog, black, black dog, or a donkey. That's why I just said, Shabbatimuna bil kilabi wal hamir. You made us like donkeys and dogs. All right, let's go back to Dr. Rukia to learn a little bit more about Dr. Rukia. Here we go. The veiling of Muslim women is a more complex issue. Very complex. Certainly the Quran requires them to behave and dress modestly, mm -hmm. but these strictures apply equally to men. <laughs> Only one verse refers to the veiling of women, stating that the prophet's wife should be behind a hijab when his male guests converse with them. The subject is very complicated. I cannot even cover it tonight, ladies and gentlemen. We have to talk about it sometime in the in the near future. No, it's not complex. It's very simple. 
It's not one verse. There are two. It's not Prophet Muhammad wives. It's all women. You don't understand your Quran, sister. Maybe you need to read the Quran before you start teaching and write 30 books about Islam. If I have time, I would love to get these 30 books and read them and expose the lies of them because I promise you, there will be 30 a great subject to cover in the future of our ministry to expose all the lies of Dr. Rukia Abdul Maksud. This is just one article I found online. Quran 40, 24, 31. Allah said, And say to the believing women to restrain their eyes and to guard their private parts and do not display their ornaments except that which appears from it and that they throw their veils over their bosoms and do not display their ornaments. We can talk about that in depth some other time if we talk about Sharia and women treatment in Sharia. I'm just talking about women Islam in general today. Because otherwise we'll be here for another three, four hours. Sam will throw me out. But here Allah is speaking to believe in women, not to the wives of Muhammad. There's another verse for the wife of Muhammad. And to cover themselves with the bosom. And give you in simple words for now. We can cover this in depth second, another time in the future. Women wear two dresses. One from the shoulder down. Another one from the head down. They only can see by one small hole in front of their left eye. So even that picture of Dr. Rukia Maksud in a beautiful hijab, that's not Islam. That's not true Islam hijab. Because the purpose of the hijab is for women to be to disappear. That men will not know who is behind the hijab. Trust me, with this hijab where you cover your hair and I can see your eyes and I can see your face, for sure I know who you are. Women should live in Islam like a stack of potato. That's when they go out of the house to go potty. As we learn from Omar and Muslim, great Muslim scholars. Talk about that later. But that's the truth of women position in Islam. Let's talk about um, polygamy. Yep, she said uh, earlier she does not believe that's Islam because uh, women should not be... Uh, uh, tre treated in that way that a Muslim man can have uh, mul multiple wives. Listen to what Dr. Rukia said about that here. What about polygamy, which the Quran endorses up to the limit of four wives per man? The Prophet, of course, lived at a time when continual warfare produced large numbers of widows who were left with little children, no provision for themselves and their children. In these circumstances, Polygamy was encouraged as an act of charity. Needless to say, the widows were not necessarily sexy young women, but usually mothers of up to six children who came as part of the deal. Don't you love that? I mean, she have an answer for everything. I never heard that answer until I saw her, her article. You see, if you ask Muslims how Islam spread all over the world, they'll tell you peace and love. Peace and love was proven evidence. Muhammad never engaged in war. Muhammad never killed anybody. There was no warfare. But if you ask why Muslim women, why Muslim men can marry four Muslim women at the time? Oh, Prophet Yusama, you understand warfare and killing and, and, and all these women who lost their husbands. Somebody have to take care of them. You see, Muhammad was allowed the Muslim men to marry these women for as an act of charity, good deeds. I mean, think about it. These women have what? Uh, six, seven, eight children, and somebody have to take care of the children. Uh, it's not about they are beautiful or sexy. It's just charity work. Excuse me. Can't you feed women without sleeping with them? Does charity require having sex with them? And wait, 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 wait. Where you come with the idea that all these widows uh, were in their uh, 50s and 60s? I mean, where you come up with this? Let me remind you again. How old was Aisha when Muhammad married her? Uh, she was six years old, and Muhammad was 51. So I don't think in Muhammad days, he used 50 years old men to go and fight. Most likely Muhammad used 20 years old, maybe 25, maybe 30 years old men. He's not going to use men in their 60s and 70s, almost uh, one, one step from going to the grave. No, he used young men. Do you think men in Muhammad days, in their 20s and 30s, will be married to older women who are just happen to be ugly, and each one of them have five, six children? Does this make sense to you? If Muhammad in his 50s married to a six years old child, I guarantee you that 20 will be still married to 10 or 15 years old child. He will not, no man in his 20 will be marrying a woman in her 50s. 
So the idea of charity is a joke. You don't have to sleep with him to feed him and take care of the children. Reasons for uh, polygamy, as I studied in Sharia, if uh, the husband is not satisfied sexually, if she cannot please him, he has the right to get a second wife. Or if she's unable to give him a child, a son. You know how many millions of Muslim women were divorced or the husband had the second and the third and the fourth wife because they could not produce for him a male? Not realizing that male, a baby boy or a baby girl is controlled by the man's sperm, not by the, by the woman's eggs. We can talk about that as huge error in the Quran in a future study. If Brother Samuel invite me back again to talk about that miracle of embryology in the Quran. Miracle. Let's talk about polygamy one more time with Dr. Rukia. She said, Polygamy is no longer common for various good reasons. The Quran states that wives need to be treated fairly and equally, a difficult requirement even for a rich man. Moreover, if a husband wishes to take a second wife, he should not do so if the marriage will be to the detriment of the first. Hmm, don't you love that? She's a theologian. I mean, she's a halogen, whatever you want. No theology, I don't believe it's a halogen. So she's a halogen. She's making up new Islam for the world. We no longer have polygamy in Islam. Are you serious? Why your husband left you for the other young one? Have you were been obedient wife and live with Islam? Right now, you'll be a second wife or third or fourth. Polygamy is a life. In the Muslim world, lots of men in Egypt do it in secret because they don't want to cause trouble with their wives and their children. So they have a second wife and third wife and fourth wife. If they can afford it, they move to America. For sure they have four wives. Thank God for warfare. Allah said you have to treat them equally. Yeah, it's very easy. Buy nothing to all of them. You don't have to buy one a card more than and you don't buy the other one a card, don't buy them anything. That is equally. Let's read the word of Allah in the Quran, Quran chapter 4, verse 3, to learn about how Muslims are taught about Brexit marriage in Islam, according to the Quran, Allah's words. And if you fear that you cannot deal fairly among the orphans, so marry what appeals to you from the women, two and three and four. So if you fear that you will not treat them equally, so one wife, or have sex with what your right hand possesses. This is near that you may not have hardship. Two or three or four. This is the law. That's what Allah wants. Two or three or four. And you have to treat them equally. That's fine. As I said earlier, don't buy anything, any, any of them. And by the way, Muhammad, the noblest example, did not treat his wife equally. Once again, he spent two nights with Aisha while each and every one of the other wife one night and his poor wife saw the big Zema no nights at all. He never had sex with her. Does this sound like a noble example to you to follow? Did Muhammad treat his wife equally? I'm sorry, he did not. Now, if you can't, I love it how Muslim stops there. So one wife, and they stopped there. They put a period after so, so one wife. And he said, so if you fear that you will not treat them equally, so one, so one, but the wife is not there, period. No, because that's not the end of the verse. And because what we read after that, or have sex with what your right hand possesses. How many? Unlimited. Yeah, you have one free Muslim woman and 20, 30, 40 slave and concubines. How do you like it, lady, if your husbands have 30 slaves next to you? He only marry you. He just have 30 other ones to have fun with in the side. Quran 65.4. Let's learn about marriage. The age of marriage in Islam. The age of marriage in Islam. And for those of your women who despair of menstruation, if you doubt that they may be pregnant, their prescribed waiting time is three months as well as for those who have not yet begun menstruation. According to Muslim scholar Al-Qurtubi, these are little children. You see, in Islam, my dear friends, you marry four wives. You can divorce all of them, replace them with other wives. 
if you divorce any of these wives, they have three months, they cannot be married to somebody else until the three months go by by. Why? Because what if she's pregnant? They want to keep the children to the daddy. They want to confuse. Okay? Because women marry too many men. One divorce, go to another one, he divorce, go to another one, he divorce. Which one if she was got pregnant? So you have to put three months to know who is the daddy. The same law was given to these women also for those who have not yet begun menstruation, little children. So if a Muslim man married to a little child, abusing a little child, that little child cannot be, and he divorced, that little child cannot be abused by another husband, another guy, unless three months go bye-bye. Why? Because what if she's pregnant? We're talking about a little child who have not yet had her first period. It doesn't matter. Muslim men can't be married little children, and they can be involved sexually, because if you just marry on paper, she can be divorced or marry another guy. No, three months in case she is pregnant. That's what we see. <laughs> this is his wife here, beautiful the young lady, with her grandpa. That's a husband and wife in Yemen. Can you imagine that man? I guess he's what, 65, 70 years old, married to what, uh, eight, nine, ten? I don't know what old she is. She looked like a little girl to me. Oh, you see, bunch of uh, bunch of girls married to a grown-up man. Now, this causes problem today in England. Believe it or not, this is a problem in England. So let's see what's happening in England. Let me be sure about that. No, not with you. It was another group about what's going on with the Muslim in England as the little girls in England. Here we go. Listen carefully. Now, another town this week joined the list of shame where sex gangs have roamed seemingly unchecked to prey on girls as young as 11, raping, drugging, beating, trafficking, and potentially even murdering them in the process. What's happened in Telford could be the worst case of a paedophile gang involved in widespread child abuse the country has ever seen. But as I read the names of those convicted, something struck me. In Telford, they included Azir Ali Mahmoud, Mubarak Ali, and Adel Ali. In a similar case in Rotherham, Razwan Razag, Adil Hussein, and Zafran Razan were among the guilty. To Rochdale now, Mohammed Amin, Abdul Aziz, and Mohammed Sajid, among others, were convicted. And now to Oxford, where it was Anjan Dogar, Kamir Jamil, and Zishan Ahmed ending up behind bars. Now, a very broad reckoning of the guilty shows around 80% are men of Pakistani and Bangladeshi origin. Well, a couple of observations then. Why do they appear to view white girls as objects to be traded and even disposed of? And what is their community doing about it? Nick, this is a tragedy that's been going on up and down the country. And unfortunately, the police and local councils have been complicit in covering up this scandal. Yeah, yeah. Time and time again, they have found that uh, British, Pakistani and Bangladeshi, South Asian Muslim men like me have been involved in grooming underage white girls and targeting them in what I would describe as racially motivated sexual assault. And for fear of racism, the local politicians for fear of losing votes and the police for fear of being sacked by those local local politicians have been hiding this situation. And of course, then it led to a national inquiry. We know that because the conclusions of the national inquiry were the same. I'm going to read to you something because Telford could, could well be worse yeah. than what happened in Rotherham Rotherham and Rochdale, and yet still, despite that, we have the uh, the superintendent for Telford and Wrecking, Tom Harding, saying the following. He said that um, what I would say is sexual offending across Telford and Wrecking is virtually identically proportionate to the breakdown of society, so it's not one particular section over others. Forgive the language, the French, but this is total BS, because it's confusing two types of sexual offences. Uh, we as Quilliam looked into this, and I'm going to come to the stats in a second. I know you've done a lot of work, and you've done a lot of broadcasting. You're, you're real... Well, in this area, I have to say, salute what you've done. Thank you. Ty type one, type one is the grooming of underage white girls, or any girl generally is type one as a category, the grooming of underage girls by gangs of men. Now, in type one, where, is the, where, the, where the grooming gangs are involved, it was found in our research that we found, I'm going to put this up on the screen for you, that 84% of those involved in type one, which is gang grooming of underage girls, were, when it says they're South Asian, to be specific, they were Pakistani and Bangladeshi Muslims, right? Type two, which is, I hate to use the phrase, ordinary paedophilia, what we normally understand by the word paedophilia, is representative 
of wider society. So one statistic found it was about 87% in type 2, which was paedophiles, 87% were white. Another found 100% were white. But of course, that's not surprising because the vast majority of the country is white. What's interesting is the disproportionate figure of 84%. Uh, hailing from my background. Why that's interesting is because roughly only 2% of the country are Pakistani and Bangladeshi Muslim men who are responsible for 84% of collective grooming of underage white girls. Now, don't misunderstand Mr. Majid Nawaz here because you may think he's a Christian guy or a Jewish guy or an Islamic guy. No, he's actually a Muslim believer. He's a Muslim reformer. He's doing everything he can to reform Islam, like what we have here, uh, Zudi Jasser or uh, some of these wacko Muslims in America, who they think they can change Islam. What he's saying here is not the problem. The problem here is not the problem of Islam. The problem is the social uh, uh, problem, culture problem, some other problem, but have nothing to do with Allah or Muhammad. By the way, Majid Nawaz's name was added to my list of names by the SPLC. The Southern Poverty Law Center, but he have money uh, because they call him Islamophobe, as they call me Islamophobe, and he was able to sue them, and he won his case against them. He made three point five million dollar, and they wrote him a beautiful apology. It's available online. You can go and read it. They apologized to him. I'm looking for some good lawyer, American lawyer, who will take my case against SBLC, and he can make all the money. I don't want any money out of it. All I need is a letter of apology. So if you know a good lawyer who can take my case against the SPLC, please do. And we have enough evidence that we have been damaged in our ministry, the Street Wave Greece ministry, financially because of the SPLC. But Majid Nawaz did not tell the truth. As a Muslim reformer, he's lying. He put this problem of the 82% or 84% of girls who have been sexually abused all over England for 12 years was really been have been abused by two percent of muslim pakistani and bangladeshi that's a huge problem we don't talk about it in america now we will not talk about it because it's not politically correct to say this problem which by the way it's coming to a city near you just give muslims enough time in america and they will do that why because that is the sunnah of muhammad why because that's how islam is that's the reality here we go listen to what aisha said Aisha said, the prophet of Allah, prayer and peace be upon him. She's not mad at Muhammad. She's still praying that Allah pray over him and Allah bless him and Allah's peace be on him. What do you do? Married me when I was six years old and had sex with me when I was nine years old. Says who? Said Aisha. Where? Sahih Muslim. Hadith number 1422. The noble example Muhammad was a pedophilia. He was a child molester. He was a sex offender. And that's why Muslims, Pakistani and Bangladeshi know how to practice the same sunnah, the same way of life with the British young girls, 9, 10, 11 years old. And this is coming to a city near you. Just give the Muslim enough time. Welcome to Islam. What did the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians? Chapter 5, verses 31 to 33, concerning women's position in marriage, in Christianity now. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. <laughs> if a Muslim man love his wife, as he loved himself, he should allow her to have four husbands. He should allow her to do all the things which he allowed to himself. But that's not what we find in Islam. This only exists in Christianity. Let's talk about sexual intimacy. And Dr. Rukia is going to teach us something really, really important about sexual intimacy. Listen carefully. Sexual intimacy outside marriage is forbidden in Islam, including sex before marriage, adultery, or homosexual relationships. However, within marriage, sexual intimacy should be raised from the animal level to sadaqah, a form of worship, so that each considers the happiness and satisfaction of the other rather than mere self-gratification. Don't you love that? You see, in, in America and in the West, people live like animals. I'm sorry. 
even me, even men and women in America who are living together without marriage, boyfriend and girlfriend, they're living in a pure relationship, not like we see it in Islam. In Islam, it's not sadaqah. It's not good deed to have sex with your wife. In Islam, it is they're living like garbage. They're living immoral. Once again, if there's a Muslim who would like to translate for us the first slide, I'm going to put it again in the end here. I'm looking for somebody to tell us how beautiful and how pure and how sex in Islam is. Sadaqah, it's good deed, like uh, helping the poor. Uh huh. Each other. A man will have sex with wife to please her? How can she be pleased when she have zero intimacy? When she have zero good feeling in bed? Because she's already been circumcised by Allah and Muhammad. How can a woman enjoy sex in Islam? Somebody help me out here. Oh, it's culture. It's not culture. It is in the book. It is Sharia. It is Allah's word. It's Muhammad's teaching. Listen to Quran 424 to see the beauty of the pure sex in Islam. And married women are also forbidden, except all that your right hand possesses. This is the decree of Allah for you. And it is lawful to you, besides this, to seek out women with your money chaste without fornication so whatever you enjoy by it from them so give them their wages it is an ordinance and there will be no sin on you about what you have mutually agreed on after the ordinance surely allah was knowing wise so in quran 4 23 there's a list of all the women whom muslim men can have sex with and then we we'll go to 24 and married women are, are also forbidden here's another group you don't you don't have sex with married women except I love the exception all over the Quran. When you read my translation, you read the word except, the word unless, the word but, the word if, or the word when. These are very important words because what come after it will blow your mind. Except all that your right hand possesses. So if you are living in England and you can capture some married women and they are in your possession and you know they're married, it doesn't matter. You can enjoy them sexually because they are yours. They're in your hand in your right hand possessions okay besides that it is lawful to seek out women with your money don't you love that and i love how muslim will tell you this is the wajin muta the marriage for fun you can read about it in sahih muslim hadith number 3476 77 78 79 all the way until 3501 the marriage for fun go online look for the wajin al muta marriage for fun and muslim will tell you well that is the truth. This is only what Shia practice. Why is that? Because Muhammad forbid it. Well, tell me more about it. When did Muhammad forbid it? When Muhammad allowed it, and then he forbid it, and then he allowed it the second time, and he forbid it the second time, and he allowed it the third time, and he forbid it the third time, and then he never allowed it again. Says who? Well, Muhammad said so. Really? Your Muhammad allow women, allow your Muslim men, the early fathers, to enjoy themselves sexually by prostitutes not once not twice but three times and then he forbid it he said oh it's forbidden it's haram from now on you cannot have sex with women with money really why allah puts that verse in the quran i love how shia argue with zuni about that the verse says whatever you enjoy by it that is their vagina from them these are the female so give them their wages pay for it a young lady i talked to years ago when she was 18 and she never listened to my teaching about Islam. She married a Muslim man. After 10 years, by the way, she was a second wife in America. Second wife in America. After 10 years, she divorced him. And then she said to me, Brother Sama, I met with that Muslim imam from Texas. She was this time living in Louisiana. She said, I married him on the phone. I traveled all the way in my car from Louisiana to Texas. I spent the whole night with him. He had sex with me all night long. And in the morning, he gave me $250 and he threw me out of his house and say goodbye. She said, "I, you just married me last night. He said, yeah, it was marriage for fun. It was the wash muta. I enjoyed you last night. You got $250. Goodbye. A Muslim imam. Which judge will take that case? Because some imam should go in prison for abusing our females in America. No, 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 no. We're not going to take this case in a court of law because we don't have said the Muslims. There are plenty of Shia in America who enjoy marriage for fun. Prostitution is lawful in Islam. God help us. God help us. 
So I'm sorry when Dr. Rakia told us that marriage is uh, uh, sexual intimacy is pure. It is like good work. It's sadaka. I'm sorry. That's garbage. That is garbage. Let's move on. Muhammad, uh, uh, the prophet of Allah, allow men to enjoy women for money. That is prostitution. And you can go and read all these hadiths. Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the book of Nukah, and blah, blah, blah. Enough garbage there. Now, listen, listen to Quran chapter 24, verse 33, to see the purity of the sex relationship in Islam. Listen. And do not compel your young females to become prostitutes if they want to keep chaste, so that you seek the material of the world's life. And whoever compels them, so surely after they were compelled, Allah is forgiving, merciful. Don't force your young females. These are the slaves. Don't confuse this with that. These are not their daughters. Uh -huh. These are the slaves. Don't force the slave to become prostitute so you make money. But if you force it, Allah, here is the word, but. But. <laughs> so if you force them, or if you force them, but if you force them, you know what? Allah is forgiven, merciful. Yeah, Allah is forgiven, merciful. That's why ISIS were selling the Christian and Yazidi young girls for money. And the other Muslim rich men were marrying them. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We're buying them. To do what? To use them as prostitutes. To make money. It's a good business. Allah is blessing the Muslims in Islam. Quran 4, 24. So, by the way, here's 24, 33. The verse which in the book of Surah al nur which Muhammad want women to memorize. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Let's see what Dr. Rukhi also said about, about uh, marriage in Islam and uh, the difference between Islam and, uh, and Christianity concerning divorce. Contrary to Christianity, Islam does not regard marriage as made in heaven or till death do us part. They are contracts with conditions. If either side breaks the conditions, divorce is not only allowed, but is usually expected. Nevertheless, a hadith makes it clear that of all the things God has allowed, divorce is the most disliked. Allah hate divorce, but he allowed divorce. Well, if Allah hate divorce, why he allowed divorce? It's a contract. I studied that contract in school. Trust me. I know everything about that contract. We can talk about it for another hour. And in the contract, you say, here's the down payment and here's how much money I'm going to be paying you uh, as, uh, as uh, the late payment after divorce. It's all written. But it's not if every is, uh, if they both know, uh, if uh, he said, tell that take us part. They are contract with condition. If either side break the condition no no if a woman breaks the condition a man can break the condition a woman cannot control the man with this contract of marriage but a man controls the woman with that contract of marriage divorce is allowed let's continue with dr rukia who said a muslim has a genuine reason for divorce only if the spouse's behavior goes against the sunnah of islam in other words, if he or she has become cruel, vindictive, abusive, unfaithful, neglectful, selfish, sexually abusive, tyrannical, perverted, and so on. If that's the case, there will not be one couple in many of the Muslim world. It's not spouses, it is the wife. If she, if she, if she do any of that, she will be divorced, not if he or she. Man, she's an English teacher. She knows how to use her words very well in that presentation. Let's continue. In good Islamic practice, before divorce can be contemplated, all possible efforts should be made to solve a couple's problems. After an intention to divorce is announced, there is a three-month period during which more attempts are made at reconciliation. Don't you love how she make a brand new Sharia? This is brand new Islam. That's not what I study in college in Egypt. That's not what Allah said in the Quran. It's propaganda. So they will do everything they can not to get divorced. And there's three divorce, three times. No, no, no. I'm going to teach the truth about divorce. Let's get one more slide from her. And then we will share with you the truth about what the Quran said. Quran chapter 2, verses 229 and 230. If by the end of each month, the couple have resumed sexual intimacy, the divorce should not proceed. 
The three month rule ensures that a woman cannot remarry until three menstrual cycles have passed. So if she happens to be pregnant, the child will be supported and paternity will not be disputed. She says there is no instant divorce, as she said earlier in her study. And she tells that these three months gives a man and a, a, a woman the time to fix their marriage. No, these are long. These are lies. The three months in case she's pregnant. That's the only thing. And divorce in Islam is instant. Immediately, the man, the moment, the man will tell his wife, your divorce, the divorce is over. You didn't even have to say your divorce. You can say some other words, like the word your divorce, like you're not laughing for me. I'm not laughing for you. We're no longer love for each other. This marriage is over. Any of these words end the divorce on the spot. What about the three months? The three months in case a man change his mind and he want to have her back or in case she's pregnant by his child. That child have to go to the daddy, not to the mama. That's why Muslims in America are working so hard to force Sharia in our courts. Why? Because then the father, the Muslim man, will take your daughters and your sons away from you and you have nothing to do about it. Because children belong to the daddy, not to the mother in Islam. And that goes against our system and our laws, our constitution in America. Here's the word of Allah. Quran, chapter 2, verse 229, and then we're going to read verse 230. The divorce is twice. So keep them in fairness or put them away in fairness. But it is not lawful for you to take what you have given to them of anything unless they fear that they cannot keep the limits of our law. What do you mean the divorce is twice? Yes, I can divorce my wife. You are divorced. She's out. It's over. Now, within three months, I can bring her back. And then I can divorce her again. And then within three months, I can bring him back. What happened if I divorce her the third time? Listen. Here we go. The word of Allah will give us the answer. Quran chapter 2, verse 230. Allah said, So if he divorces her a third time, so it is not lawful for him to take her again until she has sex with another husband. So if he divorces her, then there will be no sin on them if they return to each other, if they think that they can keep the limits of Allah. And these are the limits of Allah. He shows them to people who know. You know what garbage is? You got it. The word of Allah in the Quran is garbage. It is immoral. It is insane. So if I divorce my wife the third time, I can no longer have her back. What I do, I found something is called Al-Muhallil. They make movies about it in Egypt. They mock in their own Quran without knowing it is the Islam teaches. What is a Muhallil? I call my body. Grab my phone. Uh-huh. Here's the phone. Hello. Muhammad, my brother, how are you? Assalamu alaikum. Hey, man, I need your help. I trust you. You are my special friend, and I trust you so much. I, I really need your help. You will, I, I, but I trust you. Hey, man, last night I got mad at my wife, and I divorced her. It was my third time. Will you please help me? Muhammad, you're my buddy. I love you, and I trust you, man. Will you? Will you? Oh, thank you so much. So, I got Muhammad, my uh, cousin, my best friend, to marry my wife. And they must have sexual relationship, not just marriage on paper. Which means they must have sex together. And if Muhammad really, really loved me, and I trust him, and, and, and I trust him, if he divorced my wife in the morning, then I can have her back. How do you like that, America? How do you like that, Dr. Rukia Abdul Maksud? I could no longer marry my wife after the third divorce until I found somebody to sleep with her after marriage, of course. And if he divorced her, I can marry her back. That is the opposite of what the Torah teach. That is the opposite of what is written in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, which Muslims claim to believe in. What is killing me, Muslims all over America, we believe in Moses and we believe in the Torah. We believe in Moses and we believe in the Torah. We believe in what Moses, what Torah. If you believe in Moses and his Torah, you're going to reject your Quran. You're going to reject your Muhammad. You will leave Islam. Here's what Moses said, which obviously the word of God in the Bible. When a man hath taken a wife, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand. She may go and be another man's wife, 
And did the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement? Or if the latter husband die, her former husband may not take her again to be his wife, after that she is defiled, for this is an abomination before the Lord. The opposite message of the Quran, the word of Allah. If I'm married to my wife and I divorce her, she take her book of divorce and she go marry another husband. If the new husband died, or if the new husband divorced her, I can no longer have my wife because that is abomination before the Lord. What the Bible call abomination, Muhammad called the lawful sin. The lawful sin. And they tell me that Islam have purity and the intimacy in Islam is not like animals. If that's not animal's lifestyle, what is animals? Oh, only man can divorce a wife. Of course, the teaching of the Quran is very clear about that. Uh, a wife cannot ask her husband to divorce her for any reason. <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise, she actually will spend eternity in hell. They will spend eternity in hell. All right, let's move on to uh, Matthew uh, 19.36. The Bible very clearly teaches that uh, a man should not divorce his wife. And what God joined together, not, not, not let not any man uh, separate. Uh, let's talk to Dr. Rukia one more time to learn a little bit more of her life. When Muslims die, strict laws govern the shares of property and money they may leave to others. Daughters usually inherit less than sons. But this is because the men in a family are supposed to provide for their entire household. Any money or property owned by women is theirs to keep, and they are not obligated to share it. Similarly, in marriage, a woman's salary is hers and cannot be appropriated by her husband unless she consents. Well, trust me, a lot of women would love to consent to get rid of their husband. Just take the whole money and leave. Leave me alone. I'm going to see how easy it is for a man to, for a woman, uh, for a man to ask a woman to divorce him. See, if a woman uh, re requests a divorce, she get nothing. The, the, in the contract, I said, some money up front before you marry and some money to be paid in payment after divorce. If she asks for divorce, she loses that money, the late payment after divorce. And it's very easy for a man to make his wife beg him to divorce her. Now, uh, the uh, inheritance is less. Uh, why? Because men are charged, men working when men provide. I remember Dr. Sahar, when I asked her that question in New Orleans uh, University, she said, this money she inherited from her daddy she will put in her pocket, she will use it to buy gold or jewelry uh, or ice cream or gift and stuff. She does not need any money. After all, she has a husband who loves her so much who take care of all her needs. So I said to her, are you assuming that every Muslim woman is married to a happy husband? What about the one who are divorced? What about the, the one whom their husband uh, 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 is dead? The widows, what about the one they never got married? Is half and is enough? In Islamic belief, in Islamic law, where a woman cannot work? You tell me, America. You tell me. Here's the word of Allah, Quran chapter 4, verse 11. As Muslim claims they inherit, but they don't tell you how much. Allah commands you concerning your children to the male, the like portion of two females. Half. Why can't she say women divorce, uh, inherit half? What is less? Here's the law in Saudi Arabia. You may think I'm making it up. I'm not making it up. Here we go. In Saudi Arabia, King Fahd bin Abdulaziz passed a law which stated that women are not allowed to work in any institution, public or private, or any government offices, no working whatsoever. The reason is because it is unlawful and stands against Islamic law and the tradition of the country. Law number 11,651. And believe me, the Muslim Brotherhood tried to put the same law in my home country, Egypt, when they took over uh, five, six years ago. And believe me, when the Muslim will take over and control the world, that will be the law for every Muslim female and then for the rest of the world. It is forbidden. Not culture. It is Islamic. A good Muslim woman, for her part, should always be trustworthy and kind. She should strive to be cheerful and encouraging toward her husband and family and keep their home free from anything harmful. Harem covers all aspects of harm 
including bad behavior, abuse, and forbidden foods. Yeah. Be good Muslim lady and you have a happy job for life with your husband, okay? Regardless of her skills or intelligence, she is expected to accept her man as the head of her household. She must, therefore, take care to marry a man she can respect and whose wishes she can carry out with a clear conscience. However, when a man expects his wife to do anything contrary to the will of God, in other words, any nasty, selfish, dishonest, or cruel action, she has the right to refuse him. Wonderful. Don't he love that? If that's the case, literally, no man in the Muslim world will have a wife. They'll all leave. All the wife will leave. No, this is a biblical language. When the Bible talks about the man is the head of the house, as the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, she's using it in her speech as if it is something Islamic. No, it is not Islamic. All right. Her husband is not her master. A Muslim woman has only one master, and that is God. If her husband does not represent God's will in the home, the marriage contract is broken. I'm sorry to say that uh, men are in charge of women. Men are the master and women are slaves in Islam. There's so much garbage Muhammad said in the Hadith. I don't have time to put it here tonight to show you that women are treated worse than garbage in Islam. They're dirtier than dirt and worse than garbage. So the, the husband for sure is a master and a woman is a slave in Islam. What should one make of the verse in the Quran that allows a man to punish his wife physically? There are important provisos. He may do so only if her ill will is wrecking the marriage, but then only after he has exhausted all attempts at verbal communication and tried sleeping in a separate bed. She's making the word of Allah to three separate steps, not all together, as we're going to see in the verse. First, he's going to preach to her, yeah, you know, honey, please be nice. Don't, don't, and a second, well, he starts, you know, a, a separate bed. He's sleeping in a different bed. And, and Dr. Saha told me if he's sleeping in a different bed, he's not having sex either. No, sweetheart, he has sex with other women. There are plenty of them. And then, and then if everything could not work, then he can, you know, beat her. And, and he would beat her lightly, not, not hard beating, really, really. Well, here is uh, uh, the, another statement uh, by uh, Dr. Rokia to learn about Muhammad, the noble example, and we learn from Muhammad a lot. However, the prophet never hit a woman, child, or old person, and was emphatic that those who did could hardly regard themselves as the best of Muslims. Moreover, he also stated that a man should never hit one of God's handmaidens, nor, it must be said, should wives beat their husbands or become inveterate nags? <laughs> wives beat their husband. Where do you live? In England? Oh, I'm sorry. She was living in England. I apologize. Uh, so maybe she have a point there. Uh, anyway, so let's uh, look at the Hadith first to learn. Did Muhammad really beat his beautiful wife, Aisha, his favorite wife? Because if Muhammad never touched a woman or hit a woman, that means uh, Muslims should not hit their wives. Listen to Aisha own Aisha's own words. Why is it, O oh Aisha, that you're out of breath? I said, there is nothing. He said, tell me, or Allah would inform me. And then I told him. He said, was it the darkness of your shadow that I saw in front of me? I said, yes. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain, and then said, did you think that Allah and his apostle would deal unjustly with you? What an evil guy Omar is. He's so mean to her. But Muhammad hit her on her chest. This is spirit wife, the six years old. Now she is maybe, I know, 11, 12 years old. She's a little bit older. Muhammad beat Aisha. Therefore, every Muslim man has the right to beat his wife. As a matter of fact, this is the word of Allah. It's not just Muhammad, Allah's word. Remember I told you, we're going to come to this verse back a little bit later. Here it is, the rest of Quran 434. And listen carefully to the word of Allah, because Muslims will not even read it right. Here's the word of Allah. And of whom you fear rebellion, so preach to them and separate from them in the beds and scourge them. So if they obey you, so do not seek a way against them. Surely Allah was higher big. And of whom you fear rebellion. Not for your wife who rebel. No, no, no. If you fear that they may rebel. 
Like they're okay, but they start, you know, a little bit. You know how the wife sometimes turn her on, on. No, when they start that, before they rebel, you do what? Three things. Not one after one after one. Three things. First of all, preach to them and separate from them in bed and scare them. In Arabic, Three go together, not one, you know, preach her for, for a few days and then uh, sleep in separate bed in a few days and then start beating her. No, three of them go together. If you fear that they may rebel, not if they rebel. If they rebel, you can kill them. Trust me, you can kill them. They're your property. You can do whatever you want to do with them, like a slave. And what is the light beating? I love how Ibn Kasir assured his Muslim uh, uh, students how severe is the punishment. He said, uh, actually, here it is, Ibn Kasir. Listen to Ibn Kasir. Here we go. In explanation of how severe the punishment should be, Ibn Kasir says that the punishment should not cause broken bones, but it should be a light beating. Light beating. No broken bones, sweetheart. Don't worry. If he beat you so hard and break some of your bones, run to the police, you go to the hospital, they do x-ray, and they found one or two broken bones, oh, he, he exceeded the limb. And what happened if this happened? That's okay. Her family meet with his family, and uh, he apologize and back, go back to normal life. That's what it is. Light beating, no broken bones. Don't you love that? All right. Let's see something else. Uh, very important hadith here uh, by Ibn Kasir commentary about Omar took his wife and beat her, then said to Asha, Memorize three things for me, which I memorized from the prophet who said, The man is not to be asked why he beat his wife. Did you learn anything from Omar? You see, people in Muhammad days live in tents, in uh, small homes. You can hear the cry of the wife of the neighbor. So in the middle of the night, you she hear, Oh, oh, she's screaming and he's beating her, or beat the daylight out of her. No broken bones. Okay, don't forget. No broken bones. Then in the morning, you don't say, hey, Mr. Smith, uh, last night I heard your wife. She was crying out loud. Now, wh why you beat your wife? Uh -uh. Don't ask why you beat, why your neighbor is beating his wife. Says who? Says Muhammad, the noble example, which means women in Islam are not beaten by their wives. Yeah, exactly. You got it wrong. How about this one? I think that's another important one here. Rafa divorced his wife, whereupon Abdur Rahman married her. Aisha said that the lady came wearing a green veil and complained to her and showed her a green spot on her skin caused by beating. It was the habit of ladies to support each other. So when Allah's messenger came, Aisha said, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. Didn't you love Bukhari? Hadith uh, number 715 in volume 7. Muslim women, the believers, were beaten by their wives, no broken bones, but their skin is greener than their clothes. Uh, use your imagination. That is, That must be light beating. I guarantee you that was light beating. How about this one? Mohammed said, hang the whip where your wives can see it. One great Muslim scholar, Abdul Latif Mushtahari, explains by saying, if admonishing and sexual desertion fail to bring forth results and the woman is of a cold, stubborn type, the Quran bestows on a man the right to straighten her out by way of punishment and beating, provided he does not break bones nor shed blood. Broken vessels under the skin, green, that's okay. But no, the blood will not come out of the skin. And don't break her bones. And uh, I love it how in America here we have the fireplace in every house is those who live in the up north and they have a family picture on the top of the fireplace or some pictures. That, no, no, in Islam, no, no pictures. Picture is forbidden in Islam. But you can hang the whip. Hang the whip where your wife can see it. So you sit in the family and you have this beautiful whip on the wall. And if your wife start the early stages of rebellions you look at the wall where the whip is and say ha ha woman and she, oh, okay okay uh, uh, i'll be nice i'll be good don't, don't beat me please don't beat me thanks to muhammad and the good advice he gave for every muslim man according to uh, the muslim scholars reasons for a wife uh, should be punished are refusing his sexual advance 
uh, leaving the house without his permission, <laughs> not concerning about her appearance or not performing religious tradition, uh, wash and prayer. Yep, there are plenty of reason here we can beat our wives in the beautiful religion of Islam. Mohammed said, if a man calls his wife to his bed and she refuses and he goes to bed angry, the angels will curse her until morning. You don't want to be cursed by the angel of Allah all night long until morning. If he asks you to go to his bed, don't they don't even hesitate. Yes, sir. We got a case in Florida where a Muslim man was taken to court and the stupid liberal judge let him go free because he was literally raping his wife. And the Muslim lawyer from CARE said, Your Honor, this is our culture. He does not know if he asks his wife to have sex with she say no. That means she say no in our culture, you know, our in our our, our okay, the judge. Thank God she actually appealed it to a higher court and they punished him. Because in Islam, it's okay for a wife to rape his wife. Welcome to Sharia, Islamic law. Uh Professor Ahmed Chalabi, yep. Correction is very good. Beat the wife is good. Uh, here we go. Muhammad also uh, gave us another wonderful saying. Muhammad here. ordered a raid on a village that opposed him. His adopted son Zaid captured an elderly woman. He tortured her mercilessly and killed her by tying her feet with ropes to two separate camels, which went in different directions, splitting her in half. That is Omu Kurfa, an older lady in her 80s, I believe, 80-something, and all her sin against the merciful prophet is she made poetry to expose him as a not prophet at all, as an evil, wicked man. Uh, finally, we're almost done here. We have a few more slides. We're almost done here. Finally, there is the issue of giving witness. Although the Quran says nothing explicit, other Islamic sources suggest that a woman's testimony in court is worth only half of that of a man. This ruling, however, should be applied only in circumstances where a woman is uneducated and has led a very restricted life. A woman equally qualified to a man will carry the same weight as a witness. Where did she come up with this? Is she making brand new Quran for the Muslim? Whoa. First of all, women in Islam are uneducated, period. Taliban was right. The Taliban decision was 100% right. Women should not go to school. They should burn the school and kill the parents who will allow the children to go to school because you're ruining Islam. Muhammad said, stay at your houses. Which means what? Go to school? Find a job? No, they stay at their homes. Muhammad only allowed women to leave the house for hijab to go party. Besides that, it's a no-no for a woman to leave the house. Quran 282, 282. Allah's word says, So if the debtor was mentally deficient or weak or cannot dictate, so let his friend dictate with fairness and call two witnesses from your men. So if there were not two men, so one man and two women of those among you whom you are pleased for witnesses, so that if one of them should make an error, the other may cause her to remember. One man and two women. First, you need, first of all, two men. You don't need any woman. You could not find two men, one man and two women of those whom you are pleased with, not the uneducated, not the stupid, not the dumb, not the, 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 the foolish one, the best of the women. But she said in her writings, this only in the case of their uneducated, their, you know, in case one of them could not remember, the other one remember. No! The best two women whom the men are pleased with equal to one man in witness. Muhammad said what? One woman of 99 women is in heaven and the rest of them are in fire. He meant hell. Muhammad also said, those who enter, most of those who enter the garden are women. So in reality, my friends, women live in Islam, women live in this world in hell. And when they die, they also spend eternity in hell. Hell here, hell there. Why are you a Muslim woman? You really believe the lies of Dr. Rukia and Dr. So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so and all these wonderful Muslim imams who dress in suits and ties in America? Here's the word of Allah. 
Here's the Quran. And here what we learn about Islam and women treatment in Muhammad saying. Literally, they're living in hell in this world and they live in hell for eternity. Once again, what the Bible said, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female for ye are all, ye are all one in Christ Jesus. That is the difference between women in Islam and women in Christianity. Once again, the challenge, as we shared before, Brother Sam, if you come to the mic, that will be awesome. I am done for tonight until we have some question from our dear friends. But here is the challenge for some Muslim imam or some Muslim scholar to read to us what is written here from the book, The Alliance of the Traveler, the punishment for fornication or sodomy, page 610. I'm not going to read it. I'm waiting for somebody, Brother Sam, to come and read to us what is written here. We'll keep it here for a month or a year or maybe five years. Depend how long you want. Go ahead, Tim. All right. So you just want me to leave that on the screen or do you want me to remove it? Just leave it there for now? Oh, yeah. I have the English for it, but we're still waiting for a good, courage Muslim imam to come and read to us and tell us how beautiful Islam. And by the way, the entire book, Sam, look at this book here. Yes. Well, I, I know you have the book, 1,200 pages. Yes, I do have the book. But unfortunately. All in Arabic and English, except that one here is only Arabic. I need the English. Somebody help me. Yes. Unfortunately, my copy is in a box somewhere in storage and I can't have access to it and I'm very disappointed. But the Lord Jesus Christ, he is God, his will be done. We, I just want to say thank you, Father, for this presentation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for first <clears throat> purchasing, purchasing, us, purchasing us by your blood, washing us, purifying mm -hmm. us to be <clears throat> the children of the living God. We love you, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Holy Spirit, for transforming us and raising up soldiers like Usama, Thank you for such wonderful men, gifts to the church of Jesus Christ. We thank you. We love you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with that said, Amen. In Jesus' name, with that said, this is the time to ask your questions. Now, before we get into the questions, the Muslims couldn't last. Muslims came in here. All they did was slander and attack and mock. They, they, they were focused mostly on me, attacking me, that, uh, you know, I'm a wife beater, and uh, I, I'm bad to my kids, and, and I've abandoned my kids, and I'm a thief. But, you know, that's that's the spirit of Muhammad. When Muhammad could not refute someone intellectually, he murdered him, and sure. he even murdered women. You mentioned Umm Kurfa. Could you repeat? Why was Umm Kurfa murdered? Simply because she wrote a poetry. She was a poet, and she wrote a poetry to expose Muhammad to the world, and she ain't split the two halves by the camels. Okay, so these are from the authentic sources of Islam. What he just told you, he's not making it up. He got it from Tariq al Tabari, history of al Tabari, which is also in Ibn Ishaq, <clears throat> Sirat al Ibn Isham. So these are from their primary sources. Now, folks, for the glory of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, is what you need to do. You need to study these arguments, re listen to this session, hit the like button, send the link. And you need to support this man's ministry. Let me just say this, and I mean this from my heart. Him and Christian Prince are my two favorite Christian apologists refuting Islam. And by the way, Osama, you know, I love you, but I can hear the echo of me, like in your microphone. You can hear. So I don't, I don't, know, if it's, no. yeah, I don't know if it's going to bother them. I don't care. I just don't want them to be bothered. Now, here's what I need you guys to do. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. We serve an infinite, infinitely rich father. And I'm asking the Holy Spirit to loosen my tongue, save me from stammering, because I have a list problem. And our Father raises up soldiers for Jesus Christ, and he stirs people's hearts to support them. Thank the Lord Jesus. We have David Wood, and he's got a massive YouTube cha channel and massive influence, and the Lord has provided for his needs. He's doing good. Thank the Lord for Jay Smith. He, too, God has raised up, and he is doing good. Financially, he and his wife are doing well. The Lord has brought in the support they need. But there are ministries, ministries that need to be exposed <clears throat> and people need to be aware of these ministries and come alongside of them prayerfully and financially. Ministries that are making huge impact in destroying the kingdom of darkness, inoculating non-Muslims <clears throat> from the filth and the disease and the evil of Islam and strengthening them in their love for Jesus Christ that are still not there being fully supported. And one of them is Usama Dagdo. I know we're not rich. I wish I was. I know many of you are not. I know because of COVID-19, 
A lot of us are getting hit. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to prayerfully consider by the power of the Holy Spirit leading you to make sacrifices to support the ministries that are still not fully supported or funded because God has called some people to full-time ministry. He's one of them. I'm another. And I wish I was like Ravi Zachariah International where Ravi Zachariah built his ministry and brought in hundreds of thousands. Man of integrity is now with the Lord so he could then fully support ministers. I wish I had that so I can fully support him. If I had the ability, he'd be the first. I would make sure he's fully funded because you see, he knows Arabic. He knows the Muslim sources inside and out. He's bold as a lion. He's not afraid of dying for Jesus Christ. And he said something. I don't know if you heard. I don't know if you heard it, if you've been paying attention. He has the heart of Jesus because him and his lovely wife, who out of her love for Jesus, came alongside this man and married this man, knowing she'd be putting her life on the line because she, she knows Islam is not a joke. There are people out there who'd want to murder her and him. Did you hear what he said? He adopted a son. He adopted a son, reflecting the heart of the father because God adopted us in his love for us. We were lost. He adopted us by the blood of Jesus, being born of the spirit, and we are now adopted children of God because of Jesus Christ. So this man has the heart of God, but we need to make sure he's funded. So if you're going to sacrifice, don't sacrifice from supporting the work of God, from helping the orphan, the widow, and the ministers who are doing the work of God. Sacrifice on the things you don't need. You can get, a, get by with less. So you have more money in this hard time to support people like him. I want you to go to his Patreon page. We're going to have the links to his ministry, thestraightway.org, and his YouTube page. It's going to be in the description box. But we need to come alongside because he's still not there. He's not fully funded, right? Others are, and I pray God will can increase the fundings for others. I'm not saying that's bad. Glory to God, David Wood is doing good. Jay Smith, we want them to continue to have the funding to do this, but we need people like him also to be funded. So please think about it, pray, because I'm telling you, I love his ministry. I love this man. And I'm going to bring him back next week. You know why? Because he mentioned embryology. Osama, God willing, I want you here next week to do science in Islam. Can you do that? Sure. Absolutely. Right. So we need this man, uh, brethren, to be supported. And he doesn't say it. You'll never hear him ask, hey, brethren, can you partner with me financially? And he doesn't tell you. I said, I'm going to say it again. I've seen with my own eyes, this man will go to a church of 15, 20 people. He'll drive 15 hours just to preach to 15, 20 people saying, hey, this is Islam. You need to be protected. You need to know Islam to expose it for the glory of Jesus. This is the kind of man you, you need. And I won't mention names. Folks, there are some big name apologists that bring in tons of money. You know how much they ask for speaking engagement? And I know this firsthand from people who know. And I'm not going to mention names because, you know, they're going to say, see, Sam, you're a hater. You mention names. These big time name apologists, their speaking fee to come and speak in your church is $5,000 to $10,000. $5,000 to $10,000 just to come and speak at your church. Folks, if we charge that money, we'd be millionaires. We'd be living in mansions in Beverly Hills, and we'd be driving Mercedes. He he knows. He knows me and I know him. We're not doing it because we want to be rich. We're doing it because we want to glorify Jesus and be used of Jesus to see people saved and destroy these filthy satanic systems. And the most wicked is Muhammad, the son of the devil. May he burn in hell forever in Jesus' name. So can you imagine you got people asking $5,000 to $10,000 to come and speak at church? i seen this man. I travel, and Osama, you, you can tell them if I'm lying. We won't mention the place, but a small place where I came with my, my sister in the Lord. You remember you met her. We went there, and he was preaching to about 20 people in a rural, rural area. And he drove there 15 hours. This is the kind of man Osama is. I love this man, God and I, pray I can be like him. Honestly, I can have the integrity he has. Please, Jesus, make me a man of integrity like him. And I want you guys to support him. So by the grace of God, now it's time for Q&A. Now, most of you are Christians, so you may not have questions because the Muslims ran Osama. You were too much for them. I thought I was too much. You were too much for them. So, <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? 
Any questions? Um, let's see. If there's questions, we'll take. If not, we don't have any takers to translate well, it. So if you want to sure. translate it for them, we can. Well, I, I would love to translate it, but I really want to keep it for another week or two. But <laughs> here we go. Manwata bahima aw emra'a mayita aw haya bima dun al faraj aw jariyatun yamluku ba'daha aw ukhtuhu al mamluka lahu aw wata'a zawjati fi al hayd aw al dabr aw istamna bi yadihi aw atat al mar'a al mar'a la hadda alayhi wa yu'azzar. Uh, if you have children, Brother Sam, I'll go one more time. If you have children sitting next to you, please uh, let them go right now. I'm going to move to the answer for this uh, garbage in English. So if you have children or if you, anybody under 18 or under 20, for heaven's sake, please ask them to remove or just turn it off and you can watch it later. Turn it off right now or watch it later. I beg you. I don't want the little children to watch. Okay, here we go. Uh Bless me, brother, uh, brother uh, uh, Sam, and read to us this garbage. I don't want to read it to us. All right. Okay, guys. Guys, he warned you. This is the filth of Isma, uh, Islam. Expose Muhammad for the filthy son of Satan is for the glory of Jesus. Okay, I'm going to read it now. Whoever had sex with an animal or a woman, dead or alive, in the rectum. Whoever had sex with an animal or a woman, dead or alive, in the rectum. Or had sex with a slave whom he owns, part of her. Or his sister, his sister, which he owns, or have sex with his wife during the period or in the rectum or masturbate or lesbian sex, no punishment on him and he will be given an excuse. Okay, I read it. And it's right there on the screen. Let me see if I can do something before. Wait, wait, don't take it down yet. I want to see something. Tried anyway. I tried. It didn't work because I was trying. To, okay. Yep. So I was trying to get guys. I was trying to blow it up, but that's as big as it gets. So you heard the filth. I repeated it. It's there for people to see. It's big enough. Yeah. It's yeah. Good. That's good size. Okay. P perfect. Now you see it. Let's just leave it for a minute or two so it can be recorded and archived. This stream is archived. Hit the like button. Pass it on. This is the filth of Islam, folks, and they have the audacity to attack the Holy Bible, the pure word of God, of the true God, and the pure holy Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is it. The reliance of the travel traveler, the penalty for fornication or sodomy, page 610. He gave you the Arabic and the accurate translation. This is why he's a blessing. He knows Arabic. They can't deceive him. So with that said, there was one question, Osama, and this sure. comes up all the time by the Muslims. And sure. I've heard it because I had the right response to this. But sure. you're the Arabic expert, not me. I'm dependent on people like you. So let me find it. It was right here. It was about the hadith on where Muhammad struck Aisha. It was right here, guys. Can someone, the one who asked me that question, can you repost it? Because I'm trying to find it. The strike of Aisha, here it is. Yeah, but they say the Arabic is what they say, Osama. Yeah. They say that the Arabic doesn't mean to strike her. It means to push. Really? Yeah. That's that's actually, yeah, if I had to deal with that. You cause pain in her chest. Yeah. Yeah, but they said, no, it was just the push. It did, he didn't hit her. He didn't, like, slack on her chest. It was like a push. Yeah, it must, it must be a light beating, just a push. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this is the beauty of Islam. Folks, I don't see any questions, but here... We gave you the link to his uh, website, the thestraightway.org. It's going to be in the description box. There you have a way of supporting him. He's got a link. You have a link there, right, where they can come in if they want to support you. It's there on your straightway.org. Mm -hmm. The straightway.org. Okay. The straightway.org. And I appreciate you, brother, for talking about this issue, which I don't like to talk about. And I, I, I pray know. the Lord will, will use his people in his way according to his will. Yes, indeed. Yes. No, see, like I said, I know this man. He would never ask. And it's not that he's asking he's robbing the people of God. Because, guys, let me give you scripture. And I want to exhort you uh, because I want to see this man fully supported. Right? There are a few ministries we're not fully support supported. His, mine, a couple others. We trust in the Lord Jesus. Right? But here's what I want to remind you. Matthew 10.10. 10, Matthew 10.10. 10, Luke 10.7. 10, the laborer is worthy of his wages. The laborer is worthy of his food. Meaning... As a Christian, guys, let me put this in context. 
In Matthew 10, verse 8, the Lord tells the apostles who were sent out, and by extension to us, because we followed their example, freely you receive, freely you will give, meaning we can't put a price on it. So if you say, hey, would you come to my church and teach? Sure. How much? You know what? We're not, we're not going to charge. We're not putting a fee. God puts in your heart for the traveling expenses and a love offering. Amen. If not, then we're just going to do it because the Lord said, freely you receive. Jesus gave the gospel free. He didn't charge. Freely you shall give. But then he says to those who receive, see how, look at the wisdom and the beauty of Jesus. In that same context, Matthew 10, 8, in verse 10, he goes on to say, when you enter a house, sit there and eat what's given to you, for the laborer is worthy of his food. So there he puts it on the person who's receiving the gospel. You then take care of that man. That man is not going to charge you, but you then take care of him because that's what I want. And Galatians 6, verse 6, Galatians 6, verse 6, Paul exhorts Christians, share all good things with the man teaching you the word. Share all good things with the one who's teaching you. So Jesus says, my church, take care of the laborers, but you, my laborers, don't demand anything financially from them. I'll take care of it. I will tell them to take care of you, but you do it for free. Amen. And if they don't give you, they'll answer to me because your word is with me. So let's come alongside and support this man because he's one of the ministries that needs to be fully funded for the glory of Jesus Christ. Only one question I see, and we'll end it here. And I'm going to bring him back next week. Guys, I promise you, science and Islam. He'll tell me when he's available, and God willing, we'll have him on. Pray for him, his wife, his adopted son. Pray for us, for our health, our holiness, to be pure doers of the word of Jesus Christ, not just lip service. And pray for my two angels, my daughters. So here's the question. Does El Maida 45 abrogate the slave for slave, free for free verse because it says eye for an eye? It's quoting the Torah. The verse 45 Al Maida says nafs for nafs, but it's recalling a Torah teaching. So does that mean Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse 178 is uh, abrogated? What is the new verse you're talking about? In Surah al maida Muhammad's telling the Jews, why do you come to me when you have the Torah? Yeah. And it says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And saying, see, if someone, let's say, takes your eye, you take his eye. So I go, doesn't that mean that they're right there when Muhammad quotes it for the Jews? That's said, abrogating chapter 2, verse 178? No. Uh, Quran, uh, chapter, the, the retaliation of the, of the Quran, chapter 2, is not abrogated by any other passage of the Quran. Because if it was, we could have, we would have found a big seer, Tobin Khartoum tell us in the interpretation of that verse that that verse is abrogated. But not one scholar ever said that that verse is abrogated. Number one, number two, I believe the problem here is Muhammad misunderstood what the Bible talk about retaliation in the Old Testament, the eye for eye and tooth for tooth. The, 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 the Bible does not say, if I break your tooth, you break uh, as a wife uh, of uh, some husband, your husband break my wife too, so you break my tooth. If I kill somebody, I be killed, not somebody else equal to that which was killed or died. Muhammad literally made so many statements in the Quran taken out of misunderstanding what the Bible said and he made up new verses and Muslim could not see any difference because once again Muslims do not question Allah's word Muslims do not question Muhammad saying they take it for what it is and what he said is true and everybody else is wrong yep amen so folks I I believe you were blessed I was blessed hearing this stuff and hearing it from him and his passion we need people like this people who are full of passion bold lions are not afraid I'm done and I'm sick of the wishy-washy, effeminate, sissified preachers. You like them, then more power to you. I want warriors like him. Thank you, bro. Full of passion, not ashamed, bold in your face because he's fearless because he knows Jesus lives and Jesus is almighty and our lives are in the hands of Jesus, not in the hands of Muslims. That's what we want. And make sure to get his translation of the Quran. The Genesis, Genesis Quran, it is, and I'm not saying it because of him. It is the most accurate translation in English, so accurate that it reads badly in many places. When you read the English, like, man, does Osama know English? It's not because he doesn't know English. It's because he's trying to capture the mistakes of the Arabic into English. So when you read a line in his translation, it doesn't read smoothly. That's because the Arabic of the Quran doesn't read smoothly. And you can get a copy on the straightway.org. We're going to put the links in the description box. Get it, the generous Quran. Use that as your primary Quran when you're debating with Muslims. Say, no, no, that's not what the Arabic says. Here's an accurate English translation of the Arabic. 
and you'll be on your way to be lions and lionesses filled with the spirit to glorify Jesus and declare spiritual war. We're not like Muslims. We don't take swords and kill people physically. But we declare spiritual war with the sword of the spirit and destroy Islam spiritually for the glory of Jesus. So, Sama, again, thank you for being here. We love you. We're going to bring you back next week. All right? Well, 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 well. Thank you. Right. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate God you. bless you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care. Amen. Amen.